fight or flight. Uh, my name is Gabor Sabo, and um, I came here from the distant town of Modin. Most people who I met uh, know me as a per programmer, to so think about that way. Uh, I've recently started to get involved quite some in uh, Python, and there's a Python uh, and the website that I've started to build. It's quite at the beginning of it, but uh, I would like to talk more about you, or at least some of you. So if you have been to, if you if started to work at a new company, or maybe if you moved to a new project from a, an earlier, com uh, earlier team, then you probably had certain, certain expectations of how the development environment will look like. And you're probably expecting something nice, and uh, pythons in it, and, and roses, and whatever. Uh, so what you were expecting is, is something like this, that you have like a really nice version control system, you, the code, uh, you have a really nice uh, environment of uh, writing code, um, the functions that are there, they're really small and independent, and there are unit tests and uh, integration tests all over, and then there's a continuous integration environment, and everything is nice, but the reality is, is slightly different usually. So the reality is this big bowl of mud, and then you and your fellow programmers are there and fighting each other, and the code mostly, to get something moving in, in probably in the right direction, not necessarily in the same direction. And then there are, there are other people over there, standing there and watching over your shoulder and telling you that why are you moving so slowly? And they usually have a title of manager or some kind. Um, so the real situation is, looks like this more, that you have like this huge multiple hundred lines of, of functions and modules are interdependent, one depending on the other, and then the back again. And then obviously there are no tests, and it would be really hard to write tests because everything is so huge. And there's no documentation, or if there, if, if, if there is documentation, that's probably misleading or old or out of date or, or whatever. So the question, what do you do in this situation? And you're looking for some kind of a solution, and then you're, you're hoping for some kind of a silver bullet. But actually, you know the silver bullets are only working for werewolves. So you need to find something different, not a silver bullet. And that's where the, this talk comes in. So you have to get into your real humanist, human mode of, of either fight or, or flight. And the easy one is the flight one. So let's talk about that first. And that's that you just find another place to work for. And there are plenty of companies outside here, so if you are in this kind of situation, you can right away go there and try to find a new place to work for. And there are hundreds or thousands of pla other places where you can actually uh, use uh, your Python skills in a, in a pro hopefully much better environment. One thing that you, I would like to mention here, that you only see the hands of the person. So you don't know if that person is actually covered in mud or not. Anyway, that's one of the solutions. So the other, other solution would be to, to fight, so to, to go there and, and start improving things. What, is, what does that mean, actually, this fight? That we want to take this, the current situation, this big ball of mud, and slowly try to move into the, this uh, direction of a, of a more ideal world. So how do you do that? Um, the thing is that, that the reason that we are really doing it is not really because we want to work in, or not, it's not supposed to do it because we want to work in a nicer environment. That's a nice thing to do, but in the end we are paid for getting business value. And the business wants to make money. And for them, our work, it, it translates in our work to basically two things. That either we can uh, develop faster, move faster, get our product to the market faster, or that we have a higher quality, less bugs, uh, less uh, crashes, and so on. So we have, before we actually think about our solution, we have to think about the business solution. But then there's also the, the programmers, the, the value that we get from, the, from these changes. And, and some of them is that basically the, the main one maybe is that you want to protect your code. So you want to make sure that you wrote some code that works, and that will work even after some other people, or maybe you, change something else later on in the system. So obviously writing tests is one of the best ways to protect your code. And down at the end of this slide you can see your sanity, which uh, might or might not be relevant at this point for you, but uh, in the end all these things actually tie back to, uh, to the business value as well. Because if you are not satisfied in your workplace, then you will leave soon, and that they will have to find a new 
programmer and they will have to sponsor a new PyCon. Actually, that's a good idea. So, so just, just leave and then they will have to sponsor more conferences. So once you have more or less the idea that want, you want to improve something, then why do you want to improve it? Then one thing that's quite important, I think, is that you measure your, your movement. And business likes this really nice graph of going up uh, or, and, and then showing that everything is really nice. But the problem is that both of these measurements that, that the business is, is, is valuing, uh, so neither of them can be really measured easily. I mean, especially speed of development. We are known to be off by 100, by 100 or 200 percent in our estimates. So even if you improve your development time by 50 percent, it's still within the margin of error that most managers are used to. So it's going to be really difficult to prove uh, with numbers that after you work, you actually move much faster. Nevertheless, you need some kind of measurements, even if, for, if not for the managers, at least for yourself. Because in this big bowl of mud, it will be hard to keep, you, keep working. Uh, you won't see immediately results. You won't see probably results for a long time. But you can, all, you can have all kinds of measurements. So for example, you can measure test co coverage, how, which lines or how many of the lines of the code has been, have been covered in tests. Or you can measure code complexity. There are tools for this, and you can do that. And you can use all kinds of best practices and see how, much your, how well your code fits in that uh, idea. Uh, you can even look at the open, number of open tickets, which is something that business also likes to see, the number of tickets at the um, in the bug tracking system. The problem with this is that if you start actually going into the problems of the code, you might actually raise the number of bugs much more than it was earlier. So it may be a bit uh, problematic. Anyway, let's, go, let's start to actually do something. The first thing you really need to is make sure that you have version control system. And you might come from all, all of them from companies where you all use version control systems. I encountered quite a few places where either they didn't have a version control system at all, or the area where I worked, these small scripts, they don't need version control, so they, they didn't have a version control for that, or they had this um, corporate version control system with all kind of processes that meant that for each commit, I had to open a ticket and get two managers sign it. And that just means that you can't actually move forward. So I would re actually recommend to install your own version control system, do your own changes, even if the corporate has a version control system. And then once you are at the point that you actually can commit the feature to their version control system, then do it. So don't avoid it, obviously, but make, some, make a workplace for yourself that's sane for you. And Git is obviously a nice tool for this, because you don't, you don't need a, ver a server for it. You can do it in, uh, on your own machine. Then virtual end, another thing for Python, it allows you to install all the modules you need, all the extensions you need within your home directory or some, uh, within your, the project. You don't need to bother all the other people, and you don't need to interact with all the other things. And then we get to the point that we're we going to, to write tests. Then they have to pick which, which te uh, test framework you are going to use. And there are these four at least. Doc test and unit test are fine. The advantage of them is that they come with Python. And then there is Nose, and many people prefer Nose, which is supposed to be much better than uh, the other two. And PyTest, and probably most of you were in the talk uh, yesterday about PyTest, and uh, so you probably know about it. And I'm going to show a couple of examples with PyTest. The point is here is it doesn't really matter which one you start using. It just start going and start working, and then later on you will, you will eventually have to improve your test framework or test environment, just get doing it. And so the question, what kind of tests? And many people come to me and say, OK, I want to write regression tests. And I have to explain that you never write regression tests. Okay? You might write unit tests and integration tests and all kinds of other tests. Regression tests grow. So the a test is called regression test. The second and third and, most, and other times, then you run the same test. So you don't write the regression test. It just happens to become a regression test the second time. So the question is whether you write integration or unit test. And there are all kinds of other names for here, but I want to just to talk about these two. So unit tests are the tests that you test a single function without anything around, even without functions that it's supposed to call. And integration tests are these tests that are testing whether various subsystems work nicely together. Uh, 
Eventually, both of these are the same. So it doesn't really matter for me. Both of these, both integration and unit tests, are just tests that run. They have some kind of an input, they do some kind of an action, and then they, you get to the, accepted, uh, to the expected output. Well, obviously, plus minus a few bucks. But that's the basic idea for all of the tests. Actually, in the code base you have, no matter what unit test you write, they are going to be also an integration test. Because like everything is really nicely, tightly together, integrated. No matter what you write, you just run everything. Let's actually have an example of how you write tests. This is a, this is a script that many people, I saw actually many people that they, they want to make sure that you, their code work. Uh, they, they could work. So what they do is they write this simple script, and that this simple script actually runs the code, runs the function, prints out the result, and then they visually uh, look at the, the, the result and see that's okay, that's fine. And then they take this script and put it aside because they know that their code works. And what I'm saying to them is that just go ahead, add a couple of more lines, and then you now you have an automated test, and that's it. So you don't really need to more, more, put more investment. One of the big things that people tell me that we can't write tests because it's a, a lot of time and it's, it's, it, it costs a lot. And the fact that these people actually paid all the cost, but they don't reap the benefits of running the same test again and again and again. So it's much better to, to write the test. So this is really simple. Just, you just added the, the uh, wrap the whole thing into a function called test something. And then instead of printing out the result, you just compare it to the expected value and call assert to make sure that it's really the expected value. And then you can run this test, and you can run use PyTest to run it, and if everything works fine, then you get a report like this, this nice green line, and it has passed at the end. And if something is broken later on, then you will get a different report, which is usually much bigger, uh, and it has nice, nice red lines at the bottom. And it also has the expect, uh, explanation sort of of what went wrong. So it's rather nice that our simple script that we already wrote probably can be turned into a test uh, rather nicely. And then once you start writing these small tests, I would recommend that you immediately set up some kind of a continuous integration. So actually, uh, I've been doing this, what is today, today called DevOps for like, I don't know, 20 years, but now it has a name. And the whole thing is that uh, whenever I start a project, I immediately try to go till the deployment which is in test means that you have a CI as well, not just a single test. And the, the reason is that uh, even if I write tests, and at the, at the beginning it's only me writing tests for this code, uh, even if I write tests, I will forget it. And, and when I go to a vacation for three hours, people will commit changes into the version control system and might break something. So it's much better if I have a continuous integration, even for the few tests I already have. And there are all these, version, all these CI systems, like Jenkins and BuildBot, and even Travis CI, you can use. Uh, but for now, I would suggest, I would, for the beginning, I would suggest that you start just a simple cron job. Okay, don't, I mean, if you, if you don't have a CI already, of course. So just write a simple cron job that will do, pull in the latest changes, run your tests, and if something fails, then send you an email. Later on, it will, you will have time uh, and hopefully the support of management in order to install something more complex and more uh, powerful. But then there's another thing, and that's probably more, even more important, and it's mocking. And the whole problem is that we have these whole huge uh, functions, and they're interdependent, and it's really hard to test them. That's one of the reasons people don't test them. Uh, and then you have all kinds of external systems, like there was a, this company I was working with, one of the tests well, actually accessing Facebook, trying to pretend as a real user, and then doing something there, and then use that uh, uh, input for the last rest of the tests. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. One of them is that you don't want to hit Facebook for every time you run the test. After all, we are going to run the test every five minutes. The other problem, which was much bigger, is that Facebook was throwing a captcha every 10 or 20 requests. And our tests, and so our tests failed every 10 or 20 times, just because of uh, Facebook throwing this captcha. And then we got used to, and saying people were saying, okay, this test fails sometimes. But that teaches people that tests can fail and it's still okay, which is usually breaks the whole idea of testing very quickly. So that's, why, that's where mocking comes in. So we can actually replace on the fly functions or pretend that we are Facebook just for those calls, or pretend that we are some kind of a database 
just returning uh, the data that we are expecting from that system to return. So basically, we are short-circuiting some kind of an external call or some kind of a call. That's mocking. And um, I, I show you uh, two examples, I think, here. One of them is this uh, module called library, cleverly called library P, uh, pi, uh, that has uh, two functions. Uh, think about that, that both are like huge, hun multiple hundred lines of co functions. One of them is called main, and it calls another function which is called helper. And what we would like to make sure is that the main function works properly. Now, as you can see, the helper function is not really reliable. It sometimes throws an exception. And so, if you write a test like this, we learned how to write tests, right? So if you write a test for the main, and you're expecting the correct answers, this test will break once in a while, actually, quite randomly, as you might expect. And that, that's not really a good thing. And you obviously will have to fix that helper function one day, and we'll have to test it separately. But for now, we want to make sure that the main function works properly, assuming that the helper works properly. So what we do is we add mocking. We replace the helper function on the fly. And for that, we use the mock uh, module. And that's what we do is we create our own function, which I called here my helper. And that gets the same, it has the same signature as the regular helper function, as the regular helper function I'm mocking. But what it does, it just gets uh, the value and immediately returns whatever the helper is supposed to return for that input. And then there is also an exception there just to make sure that our test will fail properly if, if we call it in, in a different way. That's, I created that function. And then this next line is library helper line. So this line actually replaces, tells Python to replace the real helper function in the library model with this one that I just created. So now I can call the test, the, the main uh, function, and check whether it re uh, returns the expected value, and I don't have to worry about what the helper function does. Maybe it calls a database that I, don't, I can't access, I can't change, and so on. The other main thing that happens a lot is that you have some kind of a function, and although you're taught, or people were taught that they need to separate all kinds of things, but this function does a lot of things, including printing to the screen. So how do you make sure that you actually capture that output to the screen and check what the output was? And uh, here in this example, I have two uh, files. One of them is the echo calc, which just has a function called add that can add two numbers. And then the other one is uh, the how we use it. So we just call it. We don't have to print in our usage because it already prints. So how do we test this add function? And then here we use, again, the mock module with the string io object, wrap our code into this block of code. In this, we have, what we say is that replace the sys standard output, so everything that would go to the standard output within that with, state, with statement, instead of going to the standard output, it will go into this out object that we have just created, and then we can interrogate that one with calling the get value method. So this way, we could replace the print function within or within the test that we were within the function that we were testing with our own function and then we can test what the output was. And then once you started to write tests, and then this test will probably force you to improve your code base and help you do things. And then slowly you'll have to get other people on board. So that's the hard part, actually. Doing the, all the programming part was the easy one. But this, I mean, computers are unpredictable. But people, much worse. So the question, how do you get other people on board? How do you get them to, to, to start writing tests? After all, they have uh, been taught or they get used to this uh, environment. And one of the things, a couple of things here, it's just ideas, you have to t try it yourself, is that, well, you lead by examples to start writing your own tests and then show them how they work. And then if they review your code, they look at your code and they make some changes, show them how you can easily capture something that might have been broken because of those changes. Or offer your help writing their tests. Eventually, they might get start writing their own tests, and then things will improve. So if you can all do this well, then you might get more people on board, and that's going to be uh, much better. One of the biggest part, actually, that I found out that increasing communication between people 
that's probably the, the biggest issue you can, uh, you can, biggest thing you can do. Many, in many places I see that people are, don't really talk to each other, so you have duplicate codes because I didn't ask the other person how to do something, and then it turns out that you already, we already had a functionality for that. So hopefully this will help you get everything on board, and then you get to that nice state of everything being nice and fl is flowers. So thank you very much.